Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Frederick Edward Fabella, and today I will be discussing learning theories. Okay, so let's begin. Let's discuss first the learning theory of Ivan Pavlov called classical conditioning. Okay, so that's Ivan Pavlov. So classical conditioning is learning through association. And it was discovered by a physiologist in Russia. So his name is Ivan Pavlov. And he explains classical conditioning this way. So two stimuli are linked together to produce a new learned response in a person or an animal. All right. So look at this diagram here. So this is how Ivan Pavlov discovered his classical conditioning. So when a dog uh, is about to be fed, okay, so the response of the dog when the dog is made aware of the food, the dog will salivate in preparation for eating the food. Okay, so in this at this stage, the food is unconditioned stimulus because there is no conditioning yet. And the response of the dog is salivation. So that's called unconditioned response because, again, there is no conditioning yet. Okay. So what did uh, Pavlov attempt to do? So he got a tuning fork, which is a neutral stimulus. And, of course, when the dog is presented with the tuning fork, there is no salivation. So there is no conditioned response here. Okay. So... In order for conditioning to occur, this is what Pavlov did. Uh, simultaneous to the feeding of the dog, the, the tuning fork was sounded by Ivan Pavlov. So the dog was able to associate repeatedly the food with the tuning fork. So the tuning fork now became somewhat like a signal that the dog is about to be fed. And then... Lastly, when the conditioning is finally completed, the tuning fork becomes the conditioned stimulus. And even without the food, the dog will salivate. So the salivation because of the tuning fork is now the conditioned response. The tuning fork, again, is the conditioned stimulus. So that is classical conditioning. Okay. So let's now consider connectionism theory by Edward Thorndike. So this is Edward Thorndike. So the learning theory of Thorndike represents the original stimulus response framework or SR framework of behavioral psychology. This is learning as a result of associations formed between stimuli and responses. Such associations or habits become strengthened or weakened by the nature and frequency of the SR Pairings. Let's try to understand that more. Okay, so uh, Thorndike came up with uh, the first three laws of learning. His main three laws. What are they? So the first one is the law of readiness. So for someone to be able to learn something, the that person must be ready to learn. His physical, mental, and emotional state has to be ready for whatever is going to be learned. At the same time, the situation or the environment has to be conducive to learning. Okay? Another law by Thorndike is the law of effect. What is the emotional reaction of the learner? This has something to do with what positive outcome that comes out after the behavior, right? And whether or not the the learner will repeat the behavior will depend on his emotional reaction or the positive outcome all right the third law of thorndike is the law of exercise sometimes for a learner to be able to develop a particular skill there must be repetition or practice okay so uh, there goes the saying practice makes perfect there are some things that we need to learn through practice, through repetition, all right? So let's try to find out how this was applied. Um, if Ivan Pavlov had a dog to experiment with, Thorndike had a cat, okay? So he made use of what is called the puzzle box. Okay, so let's look at how it was done. So look at the diagram there. You have there a cage, a makeshift cage. A cat is inside, and outside the cage there is 
a uh, a plate with food inside okay so if you look closely at the cage there is a contraption there that will allow the cat to escape provided the cat discovers how to uh, trigger the contraption okay so there appears to be a lever there and if the cat is able to pull the lever the door will open and the cat will be able to exit the cage okay so since the cat cannot escape the cat will uh, move around play around with whatever it can touch inside and perhaps eventually the cat will discover the lever that will allow it to escape the cage okay and then eventually through repetition the cat will discover that the door can be opened and the cat will be allowed to escape and it will eventually be met with its reward which is the food outside the cage so let's try to analyze the situation using Thorndike's laws of learning okay all right so is the cat ready to learn how to escape is the cat's brain capable of learning this so if you have seen uh, videos on YouTube where the cat where a cat has been trained to even use the toilet seat to flush the toilet after using so if a cat can do that the cat is the cat is uh, possibly able to do this as well okay the cat will be able to learn this the ability to escape from that cage using the lever okay is there a pleasant effect for the cat if it does learn to escape yes not only will the cat be able to uh, obtain its freedom but it will be rewarded by the food that's waiting outside okay did the cat try multiple ways of escape thereby practicing a specific method yes okay so if you look at uh, how Thorndike's puzzle box operated on the cat all three laws of learning were applied and demonstrated all right so let's now proceed to another learning theory this one by B.F. Skinner he calls his theory operant conditioning okay so through operant conditioning an association is made between a behavior and a consequence whether negative or positive for that behavior so Skinner actually focused on Thorndike's law of effect and expanded it. Okay, Skinner used the term operant to refer to any active behavior that operates upon the environment to generate consequences. Okay, so uh, he also coined the term reinforcement and he distinguishes between two kinds of reinforcement the positive reinforcement and the negative reinforcement so what is positive reinforcement it is the introduction of a desired or pleasant state in order for a behavior to be repeated okay so let's give an example giving an employee a bonus for meeting a job quota the positive behavior there is the bonus and the behavior that will be repeated is meeting the quota all right okay so that is an example of positive reinforcement let's go to negative reinforcement this is the removal of an undesired or unpleasant state in order for a behavior to be repeated let's give another example for this the girlfriend so there's a couple there the girlfriend keeps nagging his boyfriend until the boyfriend gives her flowers so the negative reinforcer there is the nagging because the boy the boyfriend will want the nagging to stop the behavior that will be repeated is the boyfriend giving her flowers so in order for the boyfriend to avoid the nagging the boyfriend will give the girl flowers all right and uh, Skinner also defined what he calls positive and negative punishment. Let's discuss positive punishment first. This is the introduction of an undesired or unpleasant state in order for a behavior to be avoided. Okay, let's give an example. Disciplinary sanction given by the manager to his subordinate for being frequently late. The positive punishment is the sanction. The behavior that will be avoided is being late all right so he introduced 
an unpleasant or undesired state there, which is the sanction. All right? Okay, let's now talk about negative punishment. This is the removal of an, an undesired or, or an, a desired or pleasant state in order for a behavior to be avoided. So removing something that you like so that you will avoid doing something. Okay? Our example is when a parent lowers or lessens the daily monetary allowance given to a child for coming home late in the evening. The negative punishment is the lower allowance. Of course, you want a higher allowance. The behavior that will be avoided is coming home late in the evening. Okay, So you removed a desired or pleasant state, which is a high or big allowance, so that the behavior of coming home late will be avoided by the child next time. So that is negative punishment. Okay, so let's now talk about reinforcement schedules, which uh, B.F. Skinner also defined. So what are reinforcement schedules? They are uh, times when the reinforcement will be given to the person that you want uh, to learn the behavior. All right. So what is fixed ratio? This has something to do with the number of desired responses that is demonstrated. So you need to demonstrate a number of responses before the reinforcement is given. Example, when a salesman meets his sales quota, he receives a sales commission. So the salesman here has to reach a particular sales quota, an amount, before the sales commission is given. So there's a fixed ratio there. All right? Okay. Let's now talk about a fixed interval. This has something to do with time. It's not about responses anymore. So the example that we will consider here is when an employee comes to work every, for 15 days and gets his salary for the 15 days. So it's not fixed responses, but now it's fixed interval. Okay, so every 15 days, an employee will get his salary. So it's about a time interval. All right. Now, what about variable ratio? This is reinforcement given only after a variable number of responses have been made. Okay, and variable interval is reinforcement given only after a variable interval of time has elapsed. All right. So I will just give one example for two for these two reinforcement schedules. Gambling. All right. Why gambling? Because you don't know how many times you have to bet before you win. And you don't know how much time you have to spend gambling before you win. So there's a variable ratio and there's a variable interval. That's why some say, some experts say that gambling is very addictive because of that. You don't know when you will hit the jackpot. Okay. So let's now proceed to another learning theory, the one by Albert Bandura. This is called social learning theory. Okay, so that's Albert Bandura. Social learning theory is uh, about uh, people learning from one another via observation, imitation, and modeling. When you say modeling, it's role model, you know, finding someone as a role model. The theory has often been called a bridge between behaviorist and cognitive learning theories because it encompasses attention, memory, and motivation. All right. So if you look at this uh, picture, a uh, series of pictures here, uh, demonstrate uh, the Bobo doll experiment conducted on children. So how was this uh, uh, experiment done? Children were allowed to observe an adult. Look at the pictures at the top. There's an adult female there who is showing aggressive behavior towards a Bobo doll. And this was observed by the children. And afterwards, the children were given uh, the time to spend with the Bobo doll. And they were observed whether or not they will try to do the same thing that the adult female did with the Bobo doll. And true enough, that's what they did. They showed aggressive behavior towards the Bobo doll. Okay, so what does that mean? That uh, we can learn by observation. Okay, so that's a very different learning paradigm from the behaviorist or the classical conditioning 
paradigms of Pavlov, Thorndike, and Skinner. Okay? Because you just learn through observation. All right. So, what are the processes of social learning theory? So, let's look at the diagram here. So, the first thing that the learner has to do is to pay attention to what is being learned. Okay? So, you have to look at what's happening to the behavior uh, that you want to mimic or copy. Okay? And then, you need to be able to remember what you have watched. Okay? So, like the child there in the Bobo doll experiment, the child remembered what the adult female did to the Bobo doll. So, all right. So, that involves coding, organization, and perhaps rehearsal. And then after remembering or retention, there must be the ability to, uh, to actually execute the behavior that you want to copy. So that's called motor reproduction. Can you do it? You have the face physical capability to do it. Okay, all right. And then the motivation or motivational processes. So what will you get? What is in your mind that you will get if you do that okay so that, that that involves some form of cognition and maybe a hope or expectation of reinforcement and uh, if you go through all these stages there will be matched modeled performance okay match modeled performance you'll be able to mimic what you have observed so that ends my discussion of the learning theories. Thank you very much.